Coming up, the most pressing questions that could define Notre Dame's offense in 2023. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Tuesday, May 9th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. As always, you can watch the show on YouTube or listen on your preferred podcast platform. Whether you're watching or listening, I'd appreciate it if you took a moment to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. That way you can stay up to date on all the future episodes of the show, and that's a great way uh, to support the program if you enjoy it. My name is Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer for college football talent at the Fox Sports headquarters in L.A., and it's good to be back. Um, I'm back from the Kentucky Derby. It was an amazing weekend. Great to be back in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. But right off the bat here, I feel like I owe you guys an apology, uh, especially those of you who are listening to my last episode, which came out last Thursday prior to the Derby, prior to me leaving for vacation. And I started the show by giving out my Derby pick, which was Forte. And if you haven't been paying attention to the Kentucky Derby or what went down on this past Saturday, Forte didn't even race. It got scratched the morning of, which was a big shock to a lot of people who follow horse racing and follow the Derby because Forte was a big favorite heading into the weekend. So um, a lot of people lost some money on that. I hope that if you bet your hard-earned money, if you listen to my advice and you bet on Forte, um, I apologize. I hope that you were able to get your money back because the horse did scratch. And uh, usually that's how that's what happens. You get your money back. But if you did some crazy exact as uh, I'm really, really sorry. I will I will not be giving out any more horse racing picks on this show for the foreseeable future. I can assure you of that. But let's get to what you're here for. Um, let's talk some Notre Dame football because in today's episode, I'm going to go over the offensive depth chart now that spring practice is over. We're heading into the summer. And I'm going to share some of my thoughts on each position group. Um, I'll do the same on the defensive side of the ball in tomorrow's episode. And then later this week, i got to talk about uh, the Notre Dame hoops team because Micah Shrewsbury, Notre Dame's new men's basketball coach, has been wheeling and dealing both on the recruiting trail and in the transfer portal as Notre Dame picked up uh, some big commits. And even though we sort of expected that to happen, now that it's finally official, that's certainly a good thing for the Notre Dame men's basketball program because there's still a lot of work to do on that roster. But it's great to see Shrewsbury uh, hitting the ground running now that he's the head coach of the Fighting Irish. So I'll get to that later in the week. But for today, let's go over the offense. Let's go over the two deep, the scholarship depth chart. And I'm going to give you the most pressing question uh, as I see it for each position group. But let's start with the most important position, which, as we know, is the quarterback. So that quarterback competition that we thought was going to happen, well, that's out the door. Okay, the quarterback depth chart right now is pretty set. Now, that it could change in the second and third spot uh, later on, maybe into fall camp or after that. But right now, it seems pretty clear that the starter is going to be Sam Hartman, the transfer uh, from Wake Forest, who's entering his sixth year of college football, which seems insane. So we have... Notre Dame realistically has a grown man, an adult playing quarterback, and it's just kind of crazy every time you see the six year on the depth chart or any roster or anything like that. So that's clear. Sam's the clear number one. The backup right now, uh, I feel pretty confident, is Steve Angeli, the uh, redshirt freshman out of New Jersey. I know that some people think that Kenny Minchie could pass him up. I'm actually one of those people, but I don't think uh, that's happened, at least at this point. Like, I mean, she's only been a college quarterback for one month of practice. I know he's been with the program for a few months, but he's still got a big learning curve as he learns not only Notre Dame's offense, but how to play quarterback at the college level. So Steve Angeli with the full year under his belt and then his second spring practice sec- session, I think is the clear number two at this point. Now, again, as uh, time goes on and, and we get into the, the fall camp and Minchie has more reps, maybe with the twos, maybe he could surpass Angeli. But we'll see. I think personally, um, I know I've been a little bit critical of Angeli. I'm just not the most high on him. I think more highly of Minchie. But Steve Angeli, now with, with Tyler Buckner out the door, this is a fantastic opportunity for him. Because to be honest with you, if Tyler Buckner had stayed, I definitely thought Angeli would be out the door. Because he at this point in college football, with the way things are, Being the third quarterback just doesn't really make sense, and it gives a true freshman like Kenny Minchie the opportunity to jump you um, as the backup or on scout team. So now that's not the case. Steve Angeli is one play away from being the starting quarterback at Notre Dame right now. Um, But I think the biggest question now heading into the summer and something that we're going to have to continue to follow throughout the fall, it really just comes down to is Sam Hartman a playoff caliber quarterback? Because we know what he was able to do at Wake Forest. We saw all the production he had. He's the ACC career leader in touchdown passes thrown. That is a really impressive stat. And I just said he's a grown man playing quarterback at Notre Dame. But now the expectations are different, okay? 
the national championships are the expectation at Notre Dame. Should that be the case every single year? I might disagree with that. But I think this year with what Notre Dame has on the roster, the expectation should at least be a berth in the college football playoff. And a lot of that is going to ride on Sam Hartman and what he's able to do on Saturdays. I know that who is the backup now is a big question. And I'm certainly interested to see who that ends up being. But at this point, like this 2023 Notre Dame football team is only going to go as far as Sam Hartman takes them. It's pretty much, I don't want to say it's all on his shoulders, because obviously other guys have to contribute, but if Sam Hartman plays at an elite level, I have a great feeling that Notre Dame's team is going to play at an elite level, and if he doesn't or he ends up getting hurt, uh, then I'm going to feel a lot differently about this football team because Sam Hartman it plays the most important position. He's one of the best players, certainly one of the most proven players on the Notre Dame roster at this point, albeit for a different team. But that is going to be really important to follow this season as it pertains to the Notre Dame quarterbacks. All right, let's stick in the backfield here, and let's look at the running backs. Okay, so now with Logan Diggs out the door, he's in the transfer portal. The clear number one is Audrey Gastamay heading into his junior season, and it's not so much a 1A and 1B anymore. It's now a clear one and then it's going to be a 2A, 2B probably. And who that 2A and 2B is is going to be really interesting. Um, and at this point, I'm not totally sure who that is. Now, right now, it's safe to say that Jabron Payne is the clear number two just because Jadarian Price is still recovering from the torn Achilles injury that he suffered last season at the very beginning. But if you remember... During fall camp last year, there were some murmurs that Jadarian Price was better than every other running back on the roster as a true freshman. And I know that's, you know, some things that you just hear in camp, some of it is a little bit hyperbolic, but who knows? I don't think that we would have heard so many good things about Jadarian Price if there wasn't at least some truth to it. Like, if there's smoke, there's fire, right? So we'll see, but he still has some time to recover from that injury. So at this point, I think Jabron Bain is the clear number two. Jadarian Price is number three as he takes his time to recover from his injury. And then at four, you've got the true freshman, Jeremiah Love, who hasn't even stepped on campus yet as a Notre Dame football player. He will get to campus this summer here. And now with Diggs out the door, Jeremiah Love has a great opportunity to see the field as a true freshman. Had Diggs not left, I thought that we might see Jeremiah Love in some certain spots, maybe on jet sweeps, here and there on special teams, because he's such a freak athlete. Notre Dame could use him on the field. But now with Diggs out... I mean, running backs get hurt all the time because it just it takes such a physical toll. Playing that position is so hard in the body that you got to imagine Notre Dame is going to rotate all four of these guys throughout the fall. So Jeremiah Love is going to have his reps. And I could see a scenario where he sort of shoots up there in this step chart. But right now, it's going to be Audric Estime, Jabron Payne, Jadarian Price, and then Jeremiah Love. So my big question about this position group is – which guy is going to take the load off Estime? And I know that there's going to be multiple guys who sort of contribute into this, but there's going to be one clear number two back um, at some point in the fall. It's going to sort of work itself out via practice and via games. And last year was a little bit up and down. I mean, Logan Diggs, as productive as he was late in the season, he had a DNP against Cal. I know they called it like an illness or something like that, but he just wasn't that good or it wasn't in good standing with the Notre Dame coaching staff at that point. And then look what happened at the end of the year. Completely different player and clearly one of Notre Dame's best running backs. So that could happen with any number of these guys, whether it be Payne, Price, or Jeremiah Love. If I had to guess, I feel a little bit more confident that by the end of the season, Jadarian Price will be that number two back, given what we've heard about him. Assuming that SMA or Payne don't get hurt, that they'd like to ease Jadarian Price into the season a little bit, maybe not make him such a focal point in the offense until the latter half of the season once he's had well over a full year to recover from that torn Achilles because there's no reason to rush him um, at this point. You don't want to mess with the Achilles injury, and especially with the player with so much potential. You don't want to risk long-term harm just to get him on the field as fast as possible. Even without Diggs, I think Notre Dame's running back room has some quality depth, and I think that the loss of Diggs really hurt but it provides a great opportunity for Payne, Price, or Love to step up and become the clear number two because you kind of know what you're getting out of Audrey Gassime. I think he's going to have a phenomenal year. I think he's going to clear 100, or excuse me, I think he's going to clear 1,000 yards rushing. But in modern college football, you can't just have one workhorse back every single down. That's just, it's not sustainable. It's not how it works anymore. You need at least two, potentially even three backs to rotate. So who's going to take the load off SMA? That is my biggest question mark about the running back room at Notre Dame heading into the summer. And then when we come back, we'll switch on over to the pass catchers and take a look at the wide receivers and the tight ends. That's coming up next. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. 
Last week I said I'd bet on the Nuggets to win the NBA Finals, and you know what? I'm sticking with it. I know that the series is tied with the Suns now 2-2, two to two, but I still think the Nuggets have the best player in the world right now in Nikola Jokic, and I think they are going to win the NBA Finals when it's all said and done. There's plenty of great things about FanDuel, but personally my favorite is the instant payout. It's so much better than dealing with all the other apps, so there's really no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Today I'm looking at Notre Dame's depth chart on offense coming out of spring practice, and I'm also sharing my most pressing question about each position group heading into the summer. I'm going to switch over to the defense in tomorrow's episode, so be sure to come check that out tomorrow. Uh, But today, for those YouTube viewers, no, you are not seeing things. I did just change my clothes in between segments. I'm going to be honest, I'm doing this out of my garage, and these L.A. summers are no joke, man. It gets... It gets pretty hot in here because there's no AC. So I did have a little wardrobe change. You're not seeing things. But let's get to the wide receivers here on Notre Dame's roster. And how I'm going to do this is I'm going to go with the first three receivers we'll likely see out on the field. So Notre Dame has, they call the receivers the X, which is your traditional boundary receiver, the Z, which is the field receiver, some usually split out wide off the ball, and then the F, which is the slot. So right now, Notre Dame's first group of wide receivers at the X is Deion Colsey, who's heading into his junior year. At the Z, you've got Tobias Merriweather, who's entering his sophomore season. And then at F, you have Jaden Thomas, who might be the best receiver on Notre Dame's roster right now. And he's a redshirt sophomore because he has that extra year because of COVID. Now, the thing with Notre Dame's receivers this year uh, is they're probably going to move around a lot, not just on the field, but also positionally. That's something that Chancey Stuckey likes. He likes his wide receivers to be versatile. And that's something that we've seen on the recruiting trail, a lot of guys with similar body types. So that way they're not confined to just one singular position. They can play multiple, they can move guys around, and that can make it difficult on defenses uh, to keep track of where guys are, and it could create some mismatches where you get a bigger receiver, fast receiver on like a linebacker or a safety, things like that. There's a lot of different things you can do when you have receivers that can do it, and Notre Dame, for the first time in a while, actually has a deep enough room where they can do that. So that's your first three. And then what I'm going to do now is, Rather than going like the backup X, who's Braylon James, he's a freshman, let's go with who's the first receiver we'll likely see coming off the bench. And I think that's going to be at the F, Chris Tyree, uh, in the slot. So he's a senior, but he has two years of eligibility as well because of the COVID year. But it also could be Jaden Greathouse, uh, who's a true freshman, really shined in the blue and gold game. He looked great, but he is still a true freshman. We'll see if he's able to keep that up throughout the fall. Chris Tyree, even though he's had a new position moving over from running back, um, there's been a lot of good things said about him coming from the Notre Dame coaching staff. Personally, I would like to see it. Um, I need to see it from Chris Tyree. We've been hearing a lot about him over the years, and we've seen flashes. Uh, The 98-yard run against Syracuse way back in 2020 comes to mind. Obviously, the huge kickoff return that changed the game against Wisconsin. All big plays, and it kind of showed the sort of breakaway speed that he has. But this is a new position. He's going to be asked to do different things. And I'm going to have to see him produce on the field on Saturdays before I can confidently say that he's the fourth best wide receiver on the team. But that's how it's looking right now. And then after those two, at the Z, you've got Matt Salerno, the former walk-on who's entering his sixth year, or Rico Flores, the true freshman who shined during spring practice. He came into Notre Dame considered to be the most physically ready uh, of the fresh and wide receivers, but then Jane Greathouse, he really shined as well in that blue and gold game, like I was mentioning earlier. So either of those two guys, I could see getting significant playing time in the fall. And then you got Braylon James, who, as I said, was is the backup X receiver. I would say that he needs the most time uh, to learn the position and develop his skills there, like footwork, things like that, how to get off the press, because he's a little bit more raw, He's a freak athlete as, as based on, on what every, everything that everyone has said about him. Uh, so he could end up being the best receiver out of these two freshmen. But right now, uh, I think he's going to be the last one off the bench that was there for spring practice. And then at the Z, you've got K.K. Smith, another wide receiver, freshman out of Texas. He hasn't even been on campus yet. He'll enroll in the summer. So we don't really know with him yet. So right now we'll put him, uh, I believe that's at the eighth spot. And that could change as well. Maybe he shines in fall camp. Maybe he shines in summer workouts and then works his way up into the rotation. But a lot of talk about the freshman wide receivers, and that is my biggest question about this position group. What can Notre Dame get out of its freshman wide receivers on Saturdays? Because I feel pretty confident in what Notre Dame is going to get out of Jane Thomas this year. He showed a lot of promise, especially at the end of the year. He turned out to be one of Notre Dame's 
most reliable pass catchers. I would say he was second on the team behind Michael Mayer at the end of the year, uh, even though Lorenzo Salas finished last season with better numbers than him. Uh, Jane Thomas was the clear number one wide receiver at the end of last season. And we'll see if he, what he's able to do this season because even though he's listed as the starting slot receiver, he's a big dude. They can move him around and do different things with him. So I feel pretty good about what they're getting there. Tobias Merriweather, even though we haven't really seen it a lot on the field Saturdays, I think he could end up being wide receiver number one, but Notre Dame really needs at least two of these freshman wide receivers to be regular contributors in the fall because each one of these guys can't have another Tobias Merriweather situation where you're like, Notre Dame needs to get them on the field, but they're not ready. Now, obviously, the difference is with these true freshmen, or at least three of them in Great House, Flores, and James, is they early enrolled, unlike Merriweather. Merriweather didn't make it uh, to the team until the summer, and I think that slowed down his progress and his ability to get on the field early last season. But then again, Benjamin Morrison was able to do it at corner, so I don't know. But I feel a little bit more confident this year, especially after what we saw from Jaden Greathouse in the spring game. I think Notre Dame is very high on their freshman wide receivers, and for good reason. I think they're great players, and I'm just curious to see which one of them is going to really shine in the in this season, in the fall, on Saturdays. And hopefully they, they don't hit a freshman wide receiver wall. Or if one of them does, then maybe another guy can come in and contribute – uh, in the interim. So that's my biggest question mark for the wide receivers. Let's shift over to the tight end. So Mitchell Evans, clear number one. He's heading into his junior season. He was the number two tight end last year behind Michael Mayer. And I think it's safe to say that there will be a little bit of a dip between maybe the greatest tight end in Notre Dame history to Mitchell Evans. And that is not meant to be negative about Mitchell Evans. I think it just says just how good Michael Mayer was. Should have been a first rounder, whatever. So at number two, I wasn't totally sure because I feel like Davis Sherwood is probably not the second best tight end on the roster, but they like using him as an H-back, especially as a blocker, and he did have a couple of nice catches in the blue and gold game, so it's not like he can't catch, but he's very physical, really good on special teams, so I actually have him as the number two tight end right now, but I think we're going to see Holden stays more when Notre Dame goes to 12 personnel, uh, and they're trying to throw out of that, because I think Holden stays entering his sophomore season at Notre Dame. Uh, I think he has a ton of potential. Eli Raritan was another kid in his class, a tight end, who probably had more, I want to I don't say more potential, but certainly was thought more highly of early on, because he was six foot six. Uh, I think Chancey Stuckey called him a Greek god, but unfortunately, he suffered his second torn ACL last year, so um, it's just going to be hard. We're going to have to wait and see with Raritan. So I think it's going to be Evans, Sherwood stays. And then you got Kevin Bauman, who's a bit of a mystery because he's a little bit more experienced than Raritan and stays. He's a redshirt junior, but he's also dealt with a ton of injuries. And early on in his career, I know Notre Dame's coaching staff was extremely high in him. So I think that there is some talent there. But you, I feel like at, at a certain point, you deal with so many injuries, it's going to impact your game negatively. And now hopefully for Obama, and he's able to recover from this one and then stay healthy and then prove himself on the field. But I've got him and Raritan splitting at the fourth and the fifth tight end. You've got Cooper Flanagan, the true freshman. It's too early to say uh, what he's going to do. He wasn't able to early enroll. So we'll see what happens from him in the summer and in fall camp. So my big question about the tight ends here is, can Mitchell Evans live up to the expectations of being tight end one at Notre Dame? I know he's not going to be Michael Mayer. That's ridiculous to ask of pretty much anyone right now. Um, And I think even though that Notre Dame is not going to get the same level of production as they did from Michael Mayer, that's fine. They're going to have a lot more wide receivers to throw to this year. Can Mitchell Evans be a reliable target on third down? Can he make plays one-on-one? Can he make contested catches? That's really what you need from a Notre Dame tight end. And I know that there's been a long line of Notre Dame tight ends who have gone to the NFL. Mitchell Evans now is the clear tight end one at Notre Dame. is going to have a great opportunity to show that he could be an NFL talent. And I think that eventually one day he could be. I would be pretty surprised if he went to the NFL after this uh, season. But hey, if he does, that probably means he had an absolute breakout year, and that would be really good for Notre Dame. And if he does leave, then they've got plenty of young guys behind him, and the tight end room at Notre Dame is always deep. But now with Mitchell Evans, he's a little bit more or a little bit less proven than some of the other tight ends in the past, and we're just going to have to see how he does now that he's the clear tight end one. All right, stick around for segment three, and I'll break down the two deep on the offensive line, and then we'll get out of here. All right, now that we've covered the skill positions, the pretty boys, let's talk about the offensive line because we know how important the offensive line is at Notre Dame. And here this season, I think they've got a really great group, but that doesn't mean there aren't still some questions. So let's go through the starting lineup. Right now, it looks like Joe Walt. I think he's going to start at left tackle. I've seen him going like top five in mock drafts, so I think he's got the starting left tackle spot secured. I think. Um, and then at left guard, you've got Billy Stroud, a little bit less proven than Joe Alt. Um, he's a retro freshman. He has not even seen the field on Saturdays at Notre Dame, but he had a really good spring practice. 
He had a ton of hype coming into Notre Dame as a recruit out of Wisconsin. He was a big-time get for Notre Dame. And now is his chance to show just how good he can be at Notre Dame. There's been some comparisons to Quentin Nelson. I wouldn't go that far just yet. I would like to wait and see it. But Quentin Nelson did have to redshirt his freshman year. Billy Schrott did the same. So right now he's projected to be the starting left guard. Then at center, you've got Zeke Carell, the fifth-year senior, who really shined at the end of last season. And then at right guard, it's looking like it's going to be Andrew Kostovich, another fifth-year senior. And then at right right tackle, rounding out the starting offensive line, you've got Blake Fisher, Richard sophomore, once the best recruit in Notre Dame's class of 2021, got surpassed by Joe Walton. I think has taken some of the spotlight off him, but I think that Blake Fisher could have an incredible year this season. And uh, Notre Dame might just have the best tackle combination in all of college football. And then you've got Zeke Carell, a reliable fifth year, anchoring the middle. You've got a you've got three really solid pieces, three known commodities on the offensive line. But the guards, that's a bit of a question mark. But before we get to that, let's go to the backups. And we're going to go with sort of like what I did with the wide receivers. Let's go through the first off the bench at the tackle, guard, and then center position because – if you go through just like the backup five, man, that doesn't always tell you the true story because if Joe Wall or Blake Fisher gets hurt, even though they're playing different positions, left or right tackle, it might be one guy coming off the bench for either one of those, and then they'll get to the other one. So right now, it's my understanding that Tosh Baker, the senior, but with two years of eligibility remaining, he is the most likely player to come off the bench first at the tackle positions. He's experienced. He's got he got some uh, game reps back in 2021. Granted, they weren't always great, but he's been around for a long time. He was once a highly touted recruit. I think he's the first guy off the bench. And then you've got Emil Wagner, a redshirt freshman as well, who had another really good spring practice, but he's obviously a lot less proven or, or has been around a, a lot less long uh, compared to Tosh Baker. So I think that there's a point in time where Emil Wagner could pass up Tosh, but right now I'd still give the nod uh, to Baker heading into the summer. And then at guard, this one's really interesting because I think going into spring, it would have felt like Michael Carmody would have been the clear first guy off the bench. But then you've got Rocco Spindler, the redshirt sophomore who had a really impressive spring. I know the fans have been clamoring for him for some time because of uh, his prestige coming in out of high school. He picked Notre Dame over Michigan. It was a big deal. He's a big-time recruit. But frankly, his development, his college has been going a little bit slower than some of us may have expected, some of us may have hoped. And there was even some talk about him transferring after the spring, but now it looks like he really impressed Joe Rudolph in his first spring. This is his third year at Notre Dame, three different offensive line coaches. Hopefully it works out with Rudolph. And he might have played his way into the first guard off the bench. Now, I'd still give the nod to Carmody at this point in time because he's a redshirt junior. He's been around the program for a long time. He's very versatile. Carmody can play tackle. He can play guard. But Carmody's really struggled with injuries in his time at Notre Dame. So it's just a matter of can he stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, I think he's got a good chance to come off the bench if Notre Dame needs it this year. But don't sleep on Rocco Spindler. He really made a name for himself in the spring. And if he carries that over to the fall, we could see him fighting for that first guard spot off the bench or even a starting job. If Kristovic doesn't impress, um, if Billy Strouth gets hurt, something like that, maybe he works his way into the starting lineup. We'll see. And then at the backup center position, you've got Pat Coogan. Coogan play, can play guard or center. He's a retreat sophomore. And I know that the Notre Dame coaching staff is pretty high on him. And frankly, we just haven't seen him a whole lot. Uh, like I said, he can play center, he can play guard, but I think right now he's the clear backup center at Notre Dame. And my biggest question mark for this group is really which guard is going to step up. That could go for Billy Shroud, that could go for Andrew Kostovich, that could go for Michael Carmody, that could go for Michael Spinner. One of those guys, if they step up and make themselves the clear starter at the left or right guard spot, does it really matter? That would give you four really good linemen to work with at Notre Dame, including one, Joe Wall, who might just be the best lineman in all of college football. Blake Fisher, who could work his way up into being a first-round pick. Zeke Krell, really reliable there in the middle. And then you get that one more guard. You could potentially have a Joe Moore award-winning offensive line, which is what Notre Dame needs in order to succeed and in order to get to the college football playoff. Notre Dame is built on the offensive and defensive line, and really I think that guard combination, whoever that ends up being, that's going to go a long way in how Notre Dame goes this season. Even though you obviously need two guys, you need all five working together as a unit to be a great offensive line. 
if Billy Shrouth can step up and be the type of player uh, that I think he can be, that is going to go so far for Notre Dame, not only for this season, but over the next two years. Because like I said, he's only a retro freshman going into this year. So his development is going to be really important. Or if Kristofic could have a Josh Lug type end of his career where he sort of bounced around, never really found a home in the starting lineup. But then his last year, I thought Lug was one of the most underrated players on the team last year. If Kristofic could do that, that'd be huge for Notre Dame's offensive line. Because then when Billy Strouth is dealing with the normal freshman growing pains that are inevitable, like, even if he's a great player, he's going to make mistakes because he's so young. It happens, and we all have to be understanding when it does happen, uh, even if it might not feel that way in the moment. I think whatever happens this year, we all have to be a little bit patient with him, but he could end up being a really great player despite those mistakes. We'll see. But if any number of these guards can step up and just make it clear, hey, they're the starting guard, there's no more competition anymore, and they, they have solidified their spot in the starting unit, I think that's going to go a long way in determining how this Notre Dame offensive line produces this year, and that's going to lead to big things for the Notre Dame entire football team. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Make sure to tune in to tomorrow's episode for a breakdown of the defensive depth chart and all those pressing questions. Um, be sure to subscribe to the show, follow the socials, which you can find on Twitter at Lockdown Irish and on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and I will see you guys tomorrow.